Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. So basically what I'm preaching about today is the courage to speak um, in many ways. And I um, have myself had struggles with pornography over the years, about a dozen years ago, maybe more. Ah, more now. Wow, time flies. Um, I was uh, doing something like that, going to a group with a bunch of guys, having accountability, working through it, speaking about it, a lot of power. Uh, a lot of freedom in speaking about these things. So, uh, well done, Joseph. Yes. And uh, we want to all um, have that kind of courage to speak. And I believe that the courage to speak comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. And specifically, it's related to the resurrection from the dead. And we're going to kind of get into that here in just a little bit. Now, um, I think I'll pray first. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you for all that you have done here today and all that you are doing. We ask that you would do even more, Lord. We pray for more freedom. Lord God, we pray for more of your power, Lord God. We pray for a resurrection from the dead here today, Lord God. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. So up to this point, we've been talking about the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was an early Christian guy. He uh, went around in the first century AD and he started churches all over Turkey, all over Greece, uh, perhaps even into Italy, some think even into Spain. Um, And he was uh, the apostle, the messenger of God sent to people who weren't Jewish and that was really his thing. But after a number of years of travel, a number of years of being on the road starting churches, um, he went back to Jerusalem, the place where he had grown up Um, He wasn't born there, but he had gone to school there, and he'd become a young man there. And he went back to Jerusalem to give an offering to the poor people in Jerusalem, specifically the poor people in the church in Jerusalem. And uh, he ended up in the temple one day, uh, undergoing a purification rite as, um, as I guess, a faithful Jewish person. In many ways, he still considered himself just a normal Jewish person. It's just that he had discovered the Messiah, King Jesus, and that had changed everything for him. Um, However, while he was in the temple, um, some uh, people who weren't too happy with what he had been doing, uh, preaching about Jesus, saw him, and they had made the assumption that he had brought his friend Trophimus with him, who was a Gentile. And you couldn't have Gentiles in the temple. It wasn't allowed. Anyway, long story, a big riot starts. People are trying to get at Paul, trying to kill him, and he's rescued by a squad of Roman soldiers who kind of pull him out. And uh, Paul manages to convince the soldiers to let him speak to the crowd, and he does that, and it goes well for a while, but then it all goes pear-shaped, and the (laughs) the crowd's like, away with this guy, we want to kill him. So then um, there's a bit of a courtroom scene uh, in front of the Jewish council of leaders. The the Roman soldier, the officer is like, what the heck is going on here? I'm going to talk to the leaders. Maybe they'll tell me what's going on. Uh, That doesn't go well either. in the midst of uh, this council session, while, while Paul is being examined by these Jewish leaders, uh, he throws a bomb out there. He says to a certain uh, element of the leaders, brothers, I am on trial for the resurrection from the dead, the resurrection of the dead. And uh, that, again, turns everything into mayhem, and Paul is hauled away by the Roman soldier again. And that's kind of where we left it last week. So Paul is in custody. Uh, in the barracks, and uh, Paul's nephew comes. So Paul apparently had a sister, and uh, Paul's nephew comes and tells him, hey, there's a rumor going around, and I think it's true, that 40 men have vowed not to eat or drink until they have murdered you. In fact, their plan is that they have asked a Jewish council to ask you to come back and once you start on your way there with, with you know, the few Roman soldiers, these 40 guys are gonna, you know, jump out of everywhere, I guess, and kill you, and presumably the soldiers with you. And Paul um, tells his nephew to go talk to the Roman officer. The Roman officer believes him, and in the middle of the night, they leave Jerusalem with 
about 500 soldiers. That is about half the garrison that would have been in Jerusalem at the time. So this immense group of soldiers accompanying Paul because the Roman officer is so worried that this whole thing is going to spark some kind of regional rebellion or conflagration or whatever. And so Paul ends up going to a town called Caesarea, which is on the coast. And uh, Caesarea is the seat of the governor, Felix, and that is where uh, Paul has his next kind of a hearing. Now it's sort of a formal court hearing in front of the governor, Felix. And that's what we're going to read about. We're in Acts 24, and this is what it says. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you, O Felix, we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man a plague. It's like, this guy's like COVID. He's like the Black Death. He's the worst. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus came from Nazareth, hence those who follow Jesus are the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that these things were so. And just parenthetically, when it says the Jews there, it means those representing the Jewish leadership. Paul was a Jew. Many of the early Christians were Jews. Um, and according to the Romans, this was just some sort of intramural Jewish food fight kind of a thing. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. <clears throat> but some Jews from Asia, which was a province in Turkey, some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So the resurrection of the dead was a topic of some uh, controversy in the Judaism of the time. Some of them believed in it, some of them didn't. And uh, you can go and look in the Old Testament, for instance, at Daniel 12. It talks about a resurrection at the end times. Uh, when uh, both the just and the unjust will be raised to the dead and some will go to a happy uh, life after that and some will not. And then we find also that Jesus himself taught about the resurrection from the dead. Um, you look at John 5 um, and Jesus speaks again about this idea of the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And then if we look at John 6, and I'll read this one, verse 38 to 40. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son 
and believe in, believe in him should have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. And then if we look um, at John 11, verse uh, 25, this one verse, this is what Jesus says. says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So the resurrection is at the core of Paul's teaching, and it's at the core, really, of the Bible. This idea of the resurrection of the dead, this idea that there will come a time at the end when the just and the unjust, the evil and the good, as it were, will be raised up from the dead. Now, we, we, we see there's a little bit of a nuance here um, when we look into the passages that we've just looked at, um, particularly when we look at John 6. Um, it's talking about all who see Jesus and believe in him. Jesus will raise him up at the last day. Because um, we know that the world is a mess today, yeah? That's not really a controversial statement, I don't think. And the reason that the world is a mess is that there's a lot of sin and a lot of evil and a lot of destruction in the world. And the reason that there's a lot of sin and evil and destruction in the world is that the world is full of people. And we all have this sin that is within us and that in many ways overpowers us. Uh, even when we want to do the right thing, we can't do the right thing. And... Um, one of the amazing things that Jesus did was when he came, he not only showed us what it means to live a righteous life, you know, he, he never did wrong, he always did good, he was always kind and compassionate, he always stood up for the right even when it was difficult or unpopular. Not only was Jesus righteous in that sense, uh, Jesus displayed the power of the kingdom of God, like he went around healing people. He could, he, he could look at anyone who was sick and he could just heal them. Or there were people who were oppressed by demons. Sometimes they would just go out of their minds and do crazy things. And Jesus could cast those demons out. Um, Jesus went around displaying the kingdom of God. He's like, this is the future, is what Jesus said. I'm going to show you the future. And he starts healing people, and he starts casting out demons, and he's doing good, and he's telling people about God. And he's telling people to repent. He's telling people to stop doing the bad stuff that you're doing. No, you need to follow me and you need to learn the ways of God. Now, one of the big puzzles of the Bible is that the, you know, after everything went bad and uh, th there was the fall in the garden, the people of Israel were supposed to be the light of the world. They were supposed to be the ones through whom uh, the whole world would be blessed and people would get to know God through them and through their example. Um, but it all went wrong because the sin was also in the heart of the people of Israel. And so instead of being the light of the world, they themselves succumbed to the darkness. And Jesus was the one who turned all that around because Jesus was the king of Israel, who was the king of the Jews. Jesus um, did all the stuff that the Jewish people were supposed to do. But he did one more thing that I think it's important that we talk about before we move on. And that's in Romans 8. And this is tied to the death of Jesus. Because there was still that problem. What about sin? How can you say I can come into the kingdom of God when I'm full of sin? How does that work? And so we look at uh, Romans 8. And we're going to look at verses, just verses 3 and 4. It's really worth reading a lot more in Romans, but we don't have the time. And this is what it says. It says, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead, but instead follow the Spirit. 
So if we believe in Jesus and if we trust in him, then we can enter into this resurrection life. We can enter into this newness of life. We can receive from God the healing and the freedom that he has for all of us. And um, one particular um, application of that is um, having a clear conscience. Paul says this in um, the passage that we just read. He says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience both towards God and towards man. Now, conflict is a daily reality for us. Is that right? I pretty much have a fight every day, I think. It might be a kind of a small one, some sort of a disagreement, something, you know. If you live with people and you bump up with people, you're going to have conflict. You're going to rub up against them in some way. I remember when I was in uh, junior high school, I was in Woodshop, and uh, I think we were making night tables. So I had this beautiful piece of mahogany, or a few pieces, actually. And I realized one day, to my horror, that I had cut it wrong. I had screwed up the whole project. You know, I had just messed up. There was no going back. There was nothing I could do. So I did, uh, predictably, I avoided conflict. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my teacher. I didn't tell anybody who was around me. I just stood there sanding the, those pieces of wood for what seemed like weeks. Every time I had that class, I'd just be sanding, 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 ever, ever finer grains of sandpaper. So that thing was like a mirror. And uh, finally, I realized, man, like this school is going to, like the school year is going to end. I haven't finished my project. I got to do something. So finally, I went and I talked to my teacher. And he was like, ah, oh. he, was, he was a man a few words, but he just kind of took it, did something, fixed it, gave it back to me. I still have the night table next to my bed. Um, <laughs> As a good reminder, just, just tell somebody, you know, just talk to somebody. But I think we all do this. I think there's a real um, conflict avoidance. There's a real, uh, it's a lot easier if you have a difficulty or rub up with somebody just to kind of avoid that person, especially if it's not like your spouse or something like that. With your spouse, you can't really avoid them, but you can avoid talking about certain things, can't you? You can just go, oh, that's a difficult place. That's a painful place. And you just kind of avoid it. And the problem with that is that we're the body of Christ. And we're not supposed to be like that. Like Israel, we're supposed to be a light to the world. And we're supposed to be a place that is full of love and a place that is full of peace. And we can be that. And in some ways, we are that. But I just felt compelled today to speak about this thing about having a clear conscience towards each other. The Bible talks about if somebody has something against you, you should go to them. Or if you have something against somebody, you should go to them and you should try to make it right. And I just think that um, that is so important. And it's an example of resurrection life because every one of these little conflicts is like a small death in the body of Christ. Every no-fly zone that we have, every no-go zone, every person that you're like, oh, oh, I didn't want to go to the bathroom, but I find myself in the bathroom. Every time that we do that, it's like a little death in the body of Christ. I want to read something from Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16. And this is Paul. If you start reading Paul's letters, and he wrote many of the letters in the New Testament, One theme that you will find that he comes back to again and again and again and again is unity. Every letter that Paul wrote, pretty much, he talks about unity. It's really quite something. Somebody pointed that out, and then I started noticing it. And this is what Paul said. He said, We we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And that is what we want, right? We want this place, this body, Trinity Central, to be healthy and growing and full of love. And the way that we do that is we speak the truth and love to one another. And the way that we find the courage to do that is the resurrection, We are full of resurrection life. No matter how badly we blow it, we will be raised up on the last day. 
There is nothing to fear. We don't even have to fear death. But here's what I do fear. I fear that God has laid an amazing destiny, an amazing promise upon us as a people here in Vancouver. But, but if we're not unified, if we're not loving each other well, if we're not an example, if we're not a light to the city of a people who love each other well, my fear is that we'll never realize the fullness of what God has for us as a people. Because as the church, as a part of the church in Vancouver, we're supposed to be like resurrection life working through Vancouver. We're supposed to be that light of life in Vancouver. So I don't want to be super heavy about this, but I do want to encourage you. If you kind of feel in your heart, yeah, there is that person that I avoid. Or man, I think he's actually kind of mad with me and I've not really done anything about it. Or, yeah, there really is that no-go zone between me and this person. I encourage you in God, prayerfully, to work it out, to speak. Go to your brother, go to your sister. All right, well, we're going to wrap this up. So I want to finish our, our, our passage and make a little call at the end of that. So we're going to continue on Acts chapter 24, just the last few verses, starting at verse 22. So uh, Paul gives his best shot. He makes his defense. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. Because Paul hasn't been judged guilty or anything. He's just in legal limbo. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. And he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he's hoping for a bribe to set him free. So he said for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So there's justice for you. So there's a remarkable thing here in that Felix calls Paul. You know, there's Felix and his wife sitting. And then they summon Paul to be before them. And Paul has to know that if this goes well, maybe he gets set free. Because this man has the power to set him free, is that he has the power of life and death over him. And Paul wants to be free, pretty clearly. He made a pretty good legal defense. Uh, he, he kind of knocked down all of their arguments. He said, you know, the main witnesses aren't even here. What are we even doing? And, and really, that, that was a good defense. He should have been released. They had nothing. But, you know, politics, right? I guess. So anyhow, Paul's thinking, man, if this goes well, um, I could be set free. But what he's also thinking is, Jesus Christ has called me to preach Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And look at this. Here's a Gentile. Paul cares more about somebody like Felix, who was justly an unpopular governor. He was brutal and cruel. Any hints of any unrest, and he suppressed it brutally with violence. He was hated by the Jewish people. It's a farce what that lawyer said. You know, oh, Festus, we're so grateful for you. Or Felix, we're so grateful for you. They hated him. And they had reason to hate him. But anyway, Paul desires much more that Felix would repent and join him in the kingdom of God than he does that he himself be free. And that shows you something about Paul's priorities, and that shows you something about the trust that Paul has in the resurrection. He's like, man, even if I rot in jail, even if Felix orders me to be killed, or if I go to Rome and then I'm killed there, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, because I will be resurrected. I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm with Jesus now, and I'm going to be more fully with Jesus in the future. So Paul speaks to Felix about righteousness. He says, hey, Felix, 
One day you're going to meet a God who can't be bribed. And what are you going to do then? He talks to Felix about self-control. So Drusilla, his wife, was his third wife. And she must have been really attractive because she used to be married to another ruler. And then Felix saw her. And he thought, wow, I want her. So th- there's a bizarre story where he gets his friend to pretend to be a magician from Cyprus. And somehow this friend convinces Drusilla in some way to leave her husband and go to Felix. So he was living in adultery with this woman as well. And Paul just kind of nails him. He says, you obviously could use some self-control because, you know, Look at who's sitting beside you there. And then he talks about judgment. And when uh, Jesus talked about judgment, he talked about missing it. He talked about being outside. He talked about there's the kingdom of God. It's a party. It's a wedding feast. There's light. There's joy. There's happiness. And then there's the outside where there's darkness and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Paul said, Felix, you're living in such a way that that is your destiny. That's the judgment that is coming towards you. And he doesn't hold back anything. He just lays it out for him. He just tells him the truth. But he does it out of love, obviously. He could have just stood mum. He could have just, you know, answered some questions. He could have curried favor and maybe been released. But instead, he chose to love him and tell him the truth. And in that time, while Paul's doing that, he's obviously getting through. Because it says that Felix was alarmed. <laughs> Felix was freaked out. Some of those words were penetrating. He could tell the truth of it. And so there was a moment there for Felix. There was a moment that he could have responded. There was a moment that he could have said, you know what, Paul, I think you're right. Please tell me more. What must I do to be saved, Paul, as had happened to Paul in other circumstances? But that didn't happen here. We don't know a lot about Felix's life after he met Paul, um, but it doesn't seem like he changed at all. Um, And then he kind of disappears out of history. So there was a moment there. There was a moment there. And I just want to ask us, in all the stuff that's happened today, we've had some moments, haven't we? And there's a moment right now. There's a moment right now. Now, maybe you're like Felix. Maybe you're somebody who's pretty far from God, and you're, you're kind of realizing it, and that's kind of settling on you. Or maybe um, you're somebody who has realized, yeah, I am on the outs with this person. There's, there's division in the body. There's something in my heart that's not right. Or I, actually, I think they're mad with me, and I've just always been too afraid to poke at it. Well, there's a moment. There's a moment right now. Uh, Kath used that picture of Jesus knocking on the door. And I think sometimes what it's like is Jesus is knocking on the door of our lives saying, hey, and we got the music turned up. You know, we're inside, we're cooking, we got the music way up, we're having a great time. It's just so noisy. Our lives are so noisy, our lives are so busy, we can't hear Jesus knocking like that. And occasionally, like at a time like this, maybe, you know, the music gets turned down and you kind of hear that knocking. And the question to us is, what are we going to do right now? Because we could just turn the music back up. We could just move past the moment. But I can't guarantee you that there will be another moment for you, for us. I can't can't guarantee that there will be another moment to make it right with Jesus, to ask that question, tell me more about Jesus, tell me more about this. I can't guarantee you there will be Another opportunity to make it right with that person. There's a moment right now. So I'm going to pray for us as we wrap this up. I'm going to pray. You think we got time for a song? Maybe the band can come up. Yeah. Dear Father in heaven, We thank you for these moments that you give us. Moments to repent. Moments to change the way that we're doing things. Moments to change the way that we're living. Moments to reach out to you, Lord. Moments to reach out to you and and grab hold of that resurrection life that you offer, Lord. You offer us peace instead of conflict, Lord. 
You offer us the kingdom of God instead of darkness and gnashing of teeth. So Lord God, I pray for everyone here, everyone who is feeling this is a moment that I have with God. Lord God, I pray for those people. I pray that they would reach out to you, Lord God. I pray that they would reach out to you. Yeah. So here's what I want you to do, if you will. Um, I would like you, if you feel that this is a moment, I would like you to just tell somebody. Tell a trusted friend. You know, just tell somebody, you know what? I just want to say this is a moment for me. You, you don't even have to get into too much detail, but have that, have that much accountability. Take some time right now or just in the next few minutes just to tell somebody who you came with, just to say, hey, that spoke to me and I want to, I want to talk about it a little further. Maybe you need to pray with it about somebody first. You know, maybe there's a, a, a big conflict and you, know, you, you need some advice, you need some wisdom, you need some prayer, that's okay. But I'm just saying, take this moment. Take this moment to reach out, put a marker down.